My message this morning is about making a fresh start. You know, Peter could be a loose cannon. When the rabble came to arrest Jesus by night, Peter was ready and he swung his sword, but all he got was an ear. <laughs> the ear of the high priest's servant Malchus. Peter was a liability. One day he testified uh, about Jesus you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, 16. But just a few verses later, Jesus had to rebuke him saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, you're a hindrance to me. <clears throat> a dangerous trap. <clears throat> you know, attacking the, <clears throat> attacking the servant of the high priest. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice, I've got guitar and there's nothing I can do about it. <clears throat> Attacking the servant of the high priest suggested that the Jesus people were troublemakers. Fortunately, Jesus acted quickly and restored the man's ear, thereby destroying the evidence of the crime. It's an interesting situation. There would be no charge of resisting arrest with violence that night at all. And furthermore, nobody would say a word about the incident because it would only draw attention to a most remarkable miracle at the centre of which was the man who they'd just arrested. So mum was the word. Malchus, of course, had an amazing story to tell, but nothing to show for it. No scar to confirm his claim. Jesus' microsurgery left no traces. Invisible sutures. I wonder who Malchus might have shared his story with. According to Matthew 26, 56, the disciples scattered after the arrest in the garden, leaving Jesus to his fate. Maybe they'd been wrong about his messiahship. Perhaps he was just another prophet about to meet a sticky end. No display of kingly power, just meek surrender. Well, the disciples wouldn't go meekly. They'd get out while they could, and that's just what they did. <clears throat> but they didn't all scatter. Peter and John followed the rabble back to the city. At the high priest's compound, people were being checked in at the gate, according to John 18, 16. And John, surprisingly enough, got in very easily. They let him straight in, no questions asked. You see, John was known to the high priest, which just goes to show it's not what you know, it is who you know. And on John's recommendation, Peter got in too. Keep in mind, Peter, a few moments earlier, had been an armed man who had attacked someone. I don't suppose he still had his weapon on him. He must have left it outside in the dark. Something else he left outside in the dark was his courage. As the servant girl let him in, <clears throat> she became suspicious. John 18, 17, she said to him, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? Where could she have got this idea from? Was it that he was with John? There's an interesting little clue in Acts 4 verse 6. Apparently Annas the high priest had a relative named John. Curious that this young disciple of the infamous Jesus should be known to the high priest. A family connection would no doubt explain his ease of entry. As Jesus' interrogation continued, <clears throat> Peter drew more attention. Standing by the fire warming himself, he was challenged again. Uh, John 18.25, you're not one of his disciples, are you? According to Luke, his reply was quite emphatic. No man, I'm not, Luke 22:58. Finally, Peter was spotted 
by a relative of Malchus. Aha. Uh -huh. So Malchus did share his story after all. John 18, 26. Didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Luke tells it this way. <clears throat> About an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them because he's a Galilean too. Luke 22, 59. With rising anger, Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. Luke and John make no mention of Peter cursing and swearing. But the accounts of Matthew and Mark are unsanitized. They spill it all. Matthew describes Peter's reaction when the rooster crowed. Matthew 26, 75. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you ever knew me. Imagine you were Peter. How might you react to that reflection? We're told he went away weeping bitterly. Then Matthew's narrative switches to Judas, <coughs> the disciple who betrayed Jesus to the priests. Like the others, he'd been concerned about Jesus' lack of progress in kingdom building, hence his first visit to the priests. Now he visits the priests again, but this time it's to confess his sin of betrayal. The priests, of course, weren't interested. They were finished with Judas. Now that they had Jesus in custody, they had no further use for this traitor. Here we see two men at a crossroads, both former friends of Jesus, intimate friends. Both had worked to promote the kingdom. Both aspired to positions of leadership in that, uh, that kingdom. <clears throat> And both had turned against Jesus in his hour of need. Peter by denying him with curses and Judas by betraying him with a kiss. What did the future hold for these two failed disciples? Not much at all for Judas, I'm afraid. His time was up. Dismissed by the priests, he went out and hanged himself, according to Matthew 27, verse 5. But it wasn't the end for Peter. He remained with the group, and they seemed unaware of his denials. If Peter kept quiet, perhaps they'd never know, and his reputation would be preserved. <clears throat> now, the women, we're told, were early risers. My wife used to be an early riser. She grew up on a farm in Queensland. Up early every morning they had cows to milk. We're told that it was around sunup, either just before or just after sunup. They went to the tomb taking the spices they'd prepared, according to Luke 24. Among them was Mary Magdalene. Uh, we're told that in John 20 verse 1. John credits her, Mary, with being the first one to witness the empty tomb. And immediately she ran to tell the others. Now who should she tell first? Why, Peter, of course. He was still with John. Evidently he had not been ostracised. And together, Peter and John ran to the tomb to check on this story that had been delivered to them by the women. John arrived first. He was younger and faster. This was the second time, you'll notice, in uh, less than three days that Peter and John found themselves together at a significant portal. On the previous occasion, John had entered first because he'd been known to the high priest. At the tomb, however, no one was checking people in and out. Even the Roman guard 
had abandoned the place. So when Peter got there, he just pushed straight in, followed by John. What did they see? Well, apart from the folded linen shroud, just an empty tomb. Imagine that. <laughs> They'd seen a dead body put in there a couple of days earlier. Now an empty tomb. And the significance of it began to sink in. John notes that seeing this, they believed, according to John 20 verse 8, until then, they hadn't understood the scriptures. You know, scriptures like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 that talk about Messiah having to rise from the dead. They hadn't understood all of Jesus' predictions of his own death. He told them about this repeatedly. They hadn't got it. The empty tomb brought all of these passages back to their attention and their remembrance. And it was the beginning of an incredible paradigm shift in their thinking and in their spiritual experience. The last chapter in the Gospel of John, which Jan read to us from a little earlier, is an epilogue. John 20 verses 30 and 31 seem to close the book, bring it to a completion. But then the narrative resumes with a final scene by the Sea of Galilee, chapter 21. John lists the participants. He names them as Peter, Thomas and Nathaniel. Not quite the same ring as Peter, James and John. Uh, plus a number of others. It's interesting that John mentions Peter first. Peter's also the first one to speak. I'm going fishing, he says. To which all the others replied, yep, we're coming with you. Despite their high hopes, they toiled all night and caught nothing. Reminds me of a time many years ago when I went fishing off the coast of New Britain on the old mission boat, the Kambubu, oh, what was it called? Anyway, the old mission boat. I toiled all night and caught one two-foot shark. <laughs> they caught nothing. At dawn, they noticed someone on the beach, but he was too far away to recognise. And as they began to, as, as they continued uh, whatever they were doing, the figure on the beach called out to them, have you caught anything? John 21 verse 5. No, they hadn't. They'd had a fruitless night. Then the unidentified one made a curious suggestion. Throw your net out on the right side of the boat and you'll catch some fish, he said. It wasn't the first time they'd received such advice. Jesus had made a similar suggestion several years earlier. On that occasion, that first occasion, Peter had objected, complaining they'd worked all night and caught nothing, so he just had a bit of a, a whinge and a grizzle. Nevertheless, he complied. And you'll recall the story, they ended up catching two boatloads and in danger of losing the boats. Well, this time the advice from the stranger was accepted without question, even though they had no idea who it was. Why would they politely respond to a stranger but give Jesus a hard time when, when he had advised them to do it before? I don't know. Sometimes perhaps we are a little more careful what we say to strangers than what we say to people we're very familiar with. Well, they threw the net out the other side and suddenly it was filled with more fish than they could handle. Do you remember how many? John 21 verse 11 tells us exactly how many to the number. 153. Have you ever wondered about the precision of this number? If I'd been telling the story, I would have said they caught, you know, 150 fish or about 150 fish. No, 153. And as I studied into this account, I was reminded that in the time of Solomon, they conducted a census that revealed the number of aliens in the community 
uh, of, of Israel, 153,000 plus a few hundred. You can read that in Second Chronicles 2.17. And these 153,000 aliens in, in, in the, among the people were all assigned to help with the building of the temple. They worked mainly as labourers and quarry workers apparently, but despite being outsiders, they were included. Perhaps Jesus would remind the seven of this over breakfast that morning. The gospel wasn't just for Jews, it was for outsiders, aliens and foreigners. Soon the identity of the stranger on the shore was revealed. John wasn't just a faster runner than Peter, he was also quicker to pick up on cues. One writer notes that John had more spiritual discernment than Peter, while Peter exhibited more decisive action. Peter was a man of action. Nudging Peter, John whispered, it's the Lord. And here's Peter all ready for fishing and not properly dressed. We're told that quickly or hastily he donned his tunic, jumped into the water and headed for shore, leaving the others to drag the boat the last 100 yards or so. Why Peter's haste? What made him so excited and so urgent to get into the water and get to the shore before the rest of them? Did he sense a need to try and restore his broken relationship with Jesus? I don't know, but maybe that's a thought. This was Jesus' third appearance to the disciples. Previously, he'd appeared once without uh, Thomas and a second time with Thomas. This time, it seems, Jesus had come mainly for the benefit of Peter. And he'd come prepared. He'd planned a beach party. He'd even brought fish and bread. Jesus had brought fish and bread. And of course, the now full net would ensure that the food wouldn't run out. Now for our main scripture, John 21, 15 to 17. After breakfast, Jesus had a question for Simon. Simon, son of John, <clears throat> do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, he told him. Again, Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. A third time, Jesus asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus would ask the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. Why repeat the question three times? Was it perhaps to give Peter three opportunities to reverse his triple denial in the courtyard of the high priest? <clears throat> Quite likely. Or was there perhaps another reason too? I notice the word Jesus used for love in verse 15 is agape. And in reply, Peter used the word phileo. In verse 16, Jesus' second question, again the word agape, and again Peter replied with phileo. But in verse 17, Jesus switched and used the word phileo. And Peter, again, phileo. What difference does it make? In English, it's just love, love, love. Greek has a number of words for love. Uh, it suggests that, that agape is a higher form of love, a wide, principled, all-embracing, inclusive kind of love, whereas phileo is a little lower. <clears throat> it's a little narrower. It's love for family and friends uh, and those around you, but not for everyone. And sermons tend to focus on this distinction. But I learned something in my research. The two words are used interchangeably, both in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, and also in the Gospel of John. John uses these two words 
quite interchangeably. Notice, for example, John 14, 23, <coughs> where John writes, my father will agape them. My father will love uh, his people. And then a couple of chapters later, in 1627, John writes, the father himself, phileo you, loves you. So, again, as I say, John uses these two words interchangeably. So it's misguided to try to build an argument based on the difference between these two Greek words to explain John 21. The main point, it seems, was Jesus' desire to reach out to Peter and restore him. Three times he doubted his denials. Three times he would reaffirm his loyalty and love. And in this way, Peter was reinstated, recommissioned, if you will. It was a big moment in Peter's life, a fresh start. It was as if the triple denial had never occurred. His shameful past would not be held against him. I'm sure we've all felt the need of a fresh start. Maybe we feel it fairly often. I don't know whether you feel it every day. But we're able to make a fresh start every day. As Paul says, we can live new lives in Christ, Romans 6 verse 4. But how does it happen? According to one of my favourite Old Testament writers, it's done by God himself. Ezekiel 11.19 says, I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them. I will take away their stubborn, stony heart and give them a tender, responsive heart. Like Peter, this is just what we need. It's certainly what I need. I'll give the last word to Peter this morning, First Peter 1, verses 3 and 5, <clears throat> where Peter wrote, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power, until you receive his salvation. I wish you a fresh start today.